Crude fundamentals remain the same, but the next conversation is lifting the ban on exports. What does this mean for the market, and what does condensate relative to other sources of crude? Yeah, let's let's uh, put some definitions in place. So there was a, a ruling uh, that Pioneer uh, Natural Resources got unilaterally, basically, from the government to export condensate. Very, very thinly distilled crude oil. It's basically crude oil. But they've got a, a unique uh, ability to export it. So it's sort of a, a semi-workaround the uh, oil export ban, which, as you know, you're not allowed to export U.S. produced crude oil to the rest of the world. And that's a unique thing for crude oil. It doesn't apply to any other commodity except, surprisingly, natural gas. But, you know, you can obviously, you can export corn and, and wheat and, and uh, cotton and all these things, but, but not crude oil. But let's look at this from a bigger picture then. If we need to export because we have a surplus, how come we're not 100% independent then? Well, the numbers say, first of all, we're not 100% independent. We use about 19 million barrels a day. We make about nine. So no matter how you slice it, you're going to have to get 10 million barrels from somewhere else every day. Besides that, there are gluts in certain areas, like in the mid-continental and on the Gulf Coast. There's big gluts from oil that's coming out of Texas, particularly the Eagleford and the Permian. It's all kind of flooding out there. And it's tough to get it out. The pipelines really don't exist to put it in the places where there's less crude here on the East Coast in some places towards the West. And to try and move it by rail is, of course, very expensive and a little bit unsafe. We've seen that. So in many ways, the gluts tend to stay where they are. Therefore, in those Gulf Coast areas down on the coast of Texas and so forth, Louisiana, a lot of these oil producers, particularly Scott Sheffield at Pioneer, right. I was looking for an end to an export Well, ban. I mean, he's looking for 40 to 50 percent chance to get that done. That could be a little bit of wishful thinking, but let's it's look at it from more a... more than wishful thinking. I don't think it'll happen, but all right. <laughs> let's look at this from a stock perspective. Right. Pioneer is a winner. Who else could be a winner, and who would this hurt if this gets lifted? Right. I mean, everybody who's playing in the Permian or has a big, uh, um, uh, you know, a big um, exposure to uh, uh, um, Eagleford would be a huge winner if the export ban was, in fact, lifted. So you're looking at uh, Diamondback, you're looking at Cimerex, you're looking at uh, Anadarko, you're looking at EOG. I mean, these are the guys who are going to be big winners. The losers on the other side will be the refiners who have uh, benefited from what has been a large glut and a very strong discounting of these kinds of uh, West Texas and East Texas crudes to the rest of the global benchmarks around the globe. And they've been making a killing, uh, as I've talked about in, right. in, in a lot of other videos, based upon very cheap crude sources. Now, is this a big enough issue? Because, like we've been saying, you think it's a little bit expensive, some of these stocks right now. And quite honestly, going into an election year, this uh, export ban lifting I mean, this is a very long, long-term speculative play. Is it big enough to really move the needle? Oh, it's if it get, comes off, it's big enough to move the needle. Of course, the the you know the um, the calculus you have to make is whether in a, an election mm -hmm. year there's any chance at all of this export ban coming off, and I don't think there's any. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. Right for the street in New York, I'm Jill Malandrino.